Is Rob Arnott is joining us right now to kick us off to the close. He's the founder and chairman at Research Affiliates. And I always feel like value is just such a, a strange word because it's kind of like a Rorschach test. It can kind of mean whatever you want it to mean. And Rob, you sort of put things, I think, in a, you put the guardrails around it, I think, in a very good way. When you look at that chart that Scarlett just had up and you look at the seeming rotation that we're starting to see into small caps, does that feel like an embrace of value to you? It feels like a tentative embrace of value. Uh, value is very near its cheapest levels ever. If you look at a blend of price earnings, price to sales, price to uh, dividends, and price to book value, uh, that blend of measures saw the spread between growth and value at the top of the dot-com bubble rise to an eight to one ratio. At the trough of the COVID meltdown, summer of 2020, it got to a nine to one ratio. During this year, it's been bouncing along very near eight or nine to one ratio, meaning growth stocks are eight to nine times as expensive as value stocks. Mm -hmm. Now here, I'm just using the very simple definition of value that's conventional, and that is stocks trading at deep discount valuation multiples. Some of those are value traps. If you can filter those out, you can do better still. But even if you don't filter those out, uh, in aggregate, value companies are doing fine. Here's a shocker. Since the value route began in 2007, mm -hmm. earnings and dividends for Russell 1000 value have grown almost identically the same as the growth in earnings and dividends for Russell 1000 growth. That's a pretty phenomenal stat here. But that gets to the question then, when we're looking for value or cheapness or whatever phrase we want to use here, and you're running all those models and doing all those filters, Rob, are you finding a long list of U.S. companies in that, on that list? Short answer is yes. There's a lot of companies on that list, but the list is longer outside the U.S. Um, Non-U.S. markets in aggregate are priced at about a one-third off relative to the U.S., whether measured on price to sales or price to book value or price to earnings or price to dividends. So if you're paying a third less for non-U.S. stocks and uh, um, paying a deep uh, discount for value both in the, and outside the U.S., it would seem to us that concentrating on U.S. growth as your core holdings is a um, dangerous exercise in picking up nickels in front of a steamroller. Mm, okay, no, we don't definitely don't want to do that. When it comes to small caps, though, um, the thinking here is that if the Fed is not going to cut rates by as much as people had anticipated, that does not bode well for these companies, which many of which are not profitable and really rely on lower borrowing costs to continue to uh, grow their operations. Well, a lot of them aren't profitable, but a lot of them are. The other thing that's very noteworthy in the markets is uh, one of the most powerful forces at work in the capital markets is mean reversion. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you have below average profit margins, you're not going to get new competitors coming on the scene. And the result is you can work your profit margins up. If you have phenomenal profit margins, um, uh, NVIDIA, take note, if your margins are phenomenal, competitors will be clamoring to try to get into your space. They'll have the effect of reducing your market share and reducing your, your profit margins. And that's, for the long-term investor, those mean reversion patterns are inevitable and powerful and are often overlooked by many investors. Yeah, that's a really important point to keep in mind. Rob, I'm curious how you think about the consensus, because when we look at earnings, um, companies are reporting better than expected results, as they usually do, because the consensus estimate has come down to kind of uh, make it a fairly low bar. And usually the consensus gravitates towards where we want it to. So how do you position yourself for those situations when um, you are looking for the surprise? Well, firstly, uh um, I love asymmetries and I love um, uh, volatility. Uh, if you don't want volatility in the markets, then stick your money in the bank. Uh, if you value the opportunities that are presented by volatility, then when something tumbles and its fundamentals don't, you may have a bargain. If something soars and its fundamentals don't, you may have a stock that's gotten ahead of itself. Volatility is our friend if we use it correctly. 
I mentioned asymmetric risks. We love asymmetric risks as well. When you're talking about Fed policy, for instance, um, Fed policy does have a bearing on growth versus value. Lower interest rates do help uh, growth stocks because the discount rate that you apply to that long-term future growth is lower, so the value of that growth is higher. But there's a more powerful link with inflation. Inflation has indeed moderated. Uh, there's an asymmetric risk. The consensus expectations for the coming 10 years are 2.3% inflation. Mm -hmm. If I ask 100 people, do you think 1.3 or 3.3 is more likely, 95 of them will say 3.3 is more likely. And if you have an asymmetric risk, that gives you additional opportunities. Inflation, rising inflation, is good for value stocks and good for small cap stocks. <clears throat> Why? Because rising inflation um, goes hand in hand with rising economic uncertainty and rising volatility. The rising volatility means that investors want to take a flight to safety, take a step back to safer stocks. Well, that tends to mean value stocks having a decent base of earnings and dividends in your portfolio. And you get that with value, you get that with small cap, and you get that with non-US. All right, always an education anytime we talk to you, Rob, and always appreciate your time. Rob Arnott, he's the founder and chairman of Research Affiliates.